Are you ready? Stand by. Welcome to the Three Gun Show, brought to you by Armalite. I am your host, Dave Hartman, and my guest today is prestige worldwide shooter Forrest Lathrop. Forrest, how you doing, man? Doing great, man. How you doing? Um, you know, I'm doing awesome. I'm excited to have you on the podcast here. You and I have shot together for a number of years here in uh, Colorado, and uh, we're going to get to know you deeply here. Oh. We're going to mess some stuff up, as we uh, as we learned just a moment ago. This sounds sensual. <laughs> well, you do have the voice for it, so... Um, for, uh, for all you listening here, we're going to have some fun. Uh, be sure to listen after the show for a special offer from Armalite. And if you're not a member of the Patreon group, sign up at patreon.com slash three gun show. That's P A T R E O N. And you can get access to all the great stuff that comes along with that private Facebook group, um, match recon podcasts and all kinds of other great stuff. This and guy it, is right here. That's right. And Patreon. Yeah. At uh, forest is a, is a patron. Uh, a patron saint of uh, of giving. Thank you, sir. Mm-hmm. Patron saint of something. <laughs> well, Forrest, man, it's uh, it's great to have you here, dude. This is the the first face to face interview that I've done in the in the new Three Gun Show World Headquarters. Yes, it's quite nice. I like the uh, the ambiance. Thanks, man. We have a cooler. We have beer. We do. We're drinking uh, Weldworks Coconut Stout. Coffee, uh, coconut, coffee stout. coconut stout. I got the coffee just for you. So we're gonna be uh, we're gonna be pumped after this one here. So yeah. cheers, thanks, buddy. Thanks for bringing a uh, beer. That's awful nice of you. Yep. Hey, sharing the wealth. So we, uh, like I said in the uh, intro, we've been we've been shooting together for a few years now, and I I think I became aware of you probably around like two or three years ago, and you kind of um, just showed up with Wes one day, following him around like a lost puppy. That sounds about right. Our buddy Wes Powell. Yeah. My uh, uh, my heterosexual life mate. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And uh that reminds me I got a funny story to tell you after this <laughs> meeting. <laughs> so the uh to to take this all back, I'm getting confused here because you're in person, usually I do this on Skype. So to take this all back, let's let's uh have the uh the audience get to know you better as a as a person, as an individual. Why don't you tell us who Forrest is? off the range like what do you do when uh when you're not shooting um contrary to popular belief there is time off the range I'm not <laughs> shooting i don't live in my jersey and my tactical pants it's really the only time i see you so i kind of suspected that that was the only thing you did yeah i think that's what most people think um no day to day i just i'm a specialist auto mechanic I specialize in european and technical diagnostics um just normal day-to-day life go to work Come home, play with guns, <laughs> feed dogs, and go to sleep and repeat. You know, it's kind of the normal thing. And then spend pretty much every weekend of my soul <laughs> shooting guns and loving it. Nice. Well, so you you mentioned a European specialist. Uh, I you also are like a diesel nut. That's kind of what I think of when I think of you. Yep. Yeah. I, I've played around on a lot of stuff. Um, done some go fast diesel stuff. I've done a lot of custom fabrication before i worked on european stuff i did uh fabrication for trophy trucks and sand rails really? and other hot rod stuff a lot of mostly fabrication background yeah like welding frames and yep. bending sheet metal and stuff like that yeah i have a literally have a semi truck full of tubing show up and a few months later roll out a trophy truck no kidding did you do that here in colorado uh arizona oh okay interesting how long did you do that Ooh. I did that. I started doing that a little bit in New Mexico, and then I moved to Arizona, and I did that for a couple of years there. And then I did a lot of a lot of my hot rod stuff. I did here in Colorado. Hmm. So, so that is like just another connected like line of three gunners here. Like a lot of the three gunners I talked to have some sort of racing background, whether it's like actually working in a shop or working on cars themselves. There's some sort of like thing that seems to translate over there from from the racing and the technical aspects of that to, to what we do in three gun or, or maybe even just firearms in general. Yeah. I think there's something about the mindset there where between, it seems like a lot of engineers, mechanics, things like that are drawn to it. And I think it's some of it's problem solving. Mm-hmm. Um, I think generally just kind of the personality of the people too. 
you just go out and play with stuff and tinker with it and have fun right yeah and that kind of is like the endless game of three gun is tinkering with things right i tinker too much i think people oh man it's i i constantly change things when i probably shouldn't but <laughs> i like it's just like with the hot rod stuff like how do you make it go faster and do this it's like i'm always playing with different things on my guns when that's one of those things where like for new shooters it's a uh, do as i say not as i do because i tell people don't yeah. spend money on all this junk that i spend money on go out buy ammo shoot you'll be better for it what do I do? Hey, look what I just bought. Yeah. Have you ever changed anything the night before a match? Oh, absolutely. Have you ever changed anything the day of a match? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> my, uh, I don't know if it was my first or second season in three gun. We had a little joke where I was consistently inconsistent with my gear. Like every, it seemed like I had to re zero my rifle every week because I was <laughs> messing around with something that I shouldn't have. But it works good now. My rifle is, shoots insanely soft. Yeah, but so, took you, it always works. Took you a long time to get there. Not really. It always worked. It's just I, I just keep messing with stuff for some reason. Well, when did uh, when did you give up? Like, uh, okay, well, let's stay on the racing thing for a minute here. So, um, when I, I you know bought a new truck around this time last year, got a bunch of help from you as far as like what years to look for for the uh, the Duramaxes for the the optimal transmission and no emissions and this and that. And, uh, and it's worked out pretty well. So where did, uh, where did the, the knowledge of Duramaxes come from here? Uh, Duramaxes came from my own truck, just messing around. I have an 03 Duramax that I proceeded to put way too much money into to try to make it a go fast. Right. It is. It's a very fast, big truck, but and now it... Can it, you quote any numbers that people would uh, can relate to? Uh, right now on the street tune, it died. was like 730 horse and 1300 foot pounds of torque. <laughs> just band mirror, you know, just very close to here. It yeah. runs like 12 flat quarters. No shit. So it's. And what, like an 8,000 pound vehicle? Yeah. Crew cab, long bed, <laughs> truck, faster than Corvettes <laughs> and everything else. It, it's very entertaining to drive around and destroy little muscle cars. Yeah. So. And leave them in a big cloud of smoke. Yeah, unfortunately. I don't like the whole smoke part, but that is a uh, that is an after effect of a lot of power in a diesel, mm-hmm. unfortunately. I'm totally cool with it when uh, someone's driving slow with their windows down. <laughs> so, <laughs> quick funny story. <laughs> we love those. Yeah. So, I was driving one day and um, some probably millennial lady driving a Prius with her window down decided I was in the, the middle lane. She decided to come from the left lane in front of me all the way over to the right lane in one swift movement about taking my front bumper off. Wow. She got into the right lane and decided to flip me off. So I noticed <laughs> that her window was down. <laughs> I proceeded to pull up next to her, hold the brake, and mat the pedal. I called her significantly. <laughs> Ouch. She didn't like it. She came back up and flipped me off again. I noticed that her window was still down. <laughs> Second dose slow learner huh yeah yeah she she learned slowly through that whole experience i hope <laughs> i hope she remembers it <laughs> she's probably on a, a podcast right now about cats telling this exact same story god i hope so probably sounds different though i probably sound like a very uh i'm sure i sound like the bad guy though yeah oh yeah oh yeah yeah in, in her version at least absolutely you know she was like all i did was cut him off and like <laughs> then he like threw all this stuff out of me from his truck and then he did it again and he doesn't even care about the environment yeah it's just carbon. It's just carbon. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that's what I wanted to get at the uh, the giant numbers behind your uh, your truck, which you know you, you kind of keep that under wraps. You don't really uh, go around and brag about that. But um, one of the matches we shot together this year, you you uh, like, oh yeah, it's thirteen hundred torque. I'm like, hey, hang on, hang on. Did you see, did you quote four numbers there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's the street tune. The race tune is a uh, thousand horse and eighteen hundred foot pounds. Jesus. So I don't ever turn that on. That does bad things. <laughs> <laughs> brakes, uh, brakes, axles, transmissions. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Second engine, fourth transmission. Oh, geez. Second rear end, like third drive shaft. Oh yeah, it it's bad. <laughs> <laughs> All right then. Yeah, I don't. I don't do that anymore. So guns are much much cheaper then. Oh, uh, yeah. So when when did it uh, change to guns for you then from uh, from racing trophy trucks from from uh, souping up your diesel? Um, 
Well, this was my third season shooting. Mm -hmm. So not really that long ago. Um, just myself and a few friends, we all had just a pistol. Like, buddy had a Beretta and I had a little XD and a, uh, I think I just started, I, man, I don't even remember anymore. I think I just started with a little XD. We went to a little local small competition and, uh, I got destroyed mm -hmm. and that's, I, was I, that here in Colorado? That was here. Yep. In Northern Colorado. Um, that's just my personality. I, I don't like to get destroyed and leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> I've got no problem getting beat, but that's just drive for me. Yeah. So I went back and got better and started winning there and thought I was like the great white in the pond and turns out I wasn't. So I went to a bigger <laughs> competition and got destroyed and uh, got better and just keeps progressing. And, you know, now I get to travel around the country with cool guys like you and shoot three gun. You know, it, it's pretty awesome. Sweet. Well, so when, uh, when you say that you went to another match after thinking you were, you know, great white swimming in a pond was that was that a three-gun match you know to be honest i don't remember if i shot a uspsa or if i went to three-gun first mm -hmm. i don't remember but i remember same thing even when i went to three-gun from pistol um i majorly got destroyed right you know i think i was in bottom third of the field or something like that where was that first match at uh world county gun club okay so and i think for most of us northern colorado shooters that's almost that's where almost all of us started it's mm -hmm. funny almost all of us northern colorado shoes we all started shooting pistol at al canyon gun club um small pistol matches and then pretty much all of us in three gun now all had our first match at weld and i think we all got destroyed because <laughs> <laughs> well, weld is known to be a technical match yeah um, well and for for uh people that aren't in colorado so weld county is like a uh, greeley area right yep and uh, a little bit a little bit east of Greeley, a little bit northeast, northeast of Greeley. Yep. Okay, um, the uh, the funny thing that that I remember about Weld County is if you type in Weld County Range into Google, it takes you to their headquarters, not the actual range. Yes, it takes you to the headquarters in Greeley. Yes, not. Yes, I screwed that one up. It was awesome. Yeah, because the range is technically in Briggsdale. Yeah, yeah. Right. I always forget the name of the the town because you, you. I don't even think. Brixdale's not that big. It's I didn't think Brixdale was actually a town. I think that's just something to call it. I don't know. It's probably the guy that lives across the street. His, his last name is Brixdale. <laughs> Maybe. I, th I think we should go with that. That's going to be official now. Yeah. Mark it. There you go. <laughs> so the uh, uh, the Weld County Fish and Wildlife Range, you, we, you know, Weld County 3-Gun, it's uh, put on by um, a bunch of dudes that we've shot with for a number of years. And for a long time, it was like one of two matches in Colorado. Right? There was like Colorado Rifle Club three gun which is like you know super super far east in buyers and then you have weld county right and so i started shooting um up at the uh the range that was associated with the place i used to work and uh it was kind of the same thing it's like oh this is really fun and then i go to weld county and it's like oh my god like these dudes are insane you know and it, it anytime i think about that sort of thing like um the guys that we shot with like you know the matt young's the drew bolts and john beasley's and and the guys that ta all taught us that kind of stuff is like they're like the uh, the local match heroes, I guess you could call them, right? And uh, when whenever guys like you and me who have only been shooting for a few years um, talk about like those early experiences, like those are always the dudes that we talk about, which is kind of fun. Yeah, absolutely. And even to this, you know, even today, it's not like those guys have slacked off. I mean, no, I wish they would. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> It's going to be Nancy Kerrigan. I'm going to meet him outside a porta potty <laughs> with a lead pipe. <laughs> Those guys are always, they're just so technically sound. Mm -hmm. And it's its made all of us better. We talk about that. Like, you know, uh, there's a few of us that in just a few years, we've grown significantly in the sport. And I think a lot of that has to do with the level of the local Colorado shooters and mm -hmm. the matches. We have some outstanding matches, some outstanding shooters. And when you can push on each other and do technical matches, that really helps progress all the shooters involved. Right. And it's like, we've talked about where, you know, we show up to a match and we were doing something dumb and, or just not efficient. And Matt Young's in the back yelling at us, you know, reverse yeah. Neil, reverse Neil, stop being dumb. Yeah. It, it's funny. You mentioned that because, uh, um, I want to, I want to say it was Matt Young. It might've been Beasley, but it was probably Matt 
that told me reverse kneel like on the clock when I'm shooting through a barricade and not hitting anything. And I was like, I don't even know what he he's. I mean, like I understand those two words alone, reverse and kneel. I don't know what he means right there. Yeah. And should then, I should I turn around and kneel towards him? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and uh i remember just being like so confused and then still so frustrated because i wasn't hitting what i was shooting at you know being done with the stage and then matt show me um what a reverse kneel was and be like well why would i do that you know and have and it had to be like explained with with great detail of like this is a stable position your arm is not moving out here in the wind you know that type of thing so the uh it, it's funny when because we we started the uh when, when you walked in the door we started bsing about guns as we always do but it's it's cool to have like those shared memories of like learning the same thing from the same people yeah and it's you know it's one of those things it's i credit those guys all the time like for me and for wes and you know the other local shooters like i honestly can tell you that in this area without those guys i i'm sure that i would not have progressed to the level in three gun that i have in this time frame you know it's um uh, I definitely attribute a lot to that. And I still try to learn from them every time I go out because those guys still are so technically sound and rarely make mistakes. And that's, even for me now, that's one of the things that I fight a lot is consistency. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll, I'll throw down a stage win and then my next stage in a national will be like 30th freaking place. And then I'll throw down <laughs> another stage win or something. I'm like, come on, man. Like there's just do one, like the, choose the top one or shoot top five or whatever. Let's, let's get some consistency going here. But yeah. that's what those guys, you know, and Matt always, I remember the first time I shot my first really big major, like I shot like pandemic and, um, the Hornady pandemic in Nebraska. Yep. Yeah. I shot that match and that was my first major. Um, but that's not a big technical major. My first big technical major was multi-gun nationals. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's one of those things like multi-gun nationals, like say a th like top three-gun shooter name in the world, they're there. Right. Like, everybody is there, and you have to shoot clean and consistent there. Um, and that was saying, like, Matt just told me, he's like, don't worry about going fast. Don't worry about burning everything down. Just shoot consistent. Don't shoot penalties. And it was one of those things, like, I ran some faster times than Matt on some of the stages, but I was shooting penalties and he wasn't. And at the end of the match, he placed really well. And I did not <laughs> <laughs> like I had some good times and you could look at my results and like I would, I had some good stage finishes, right? But in the overall, like getting a couple penalties, I, I'm, that was my first realization. It was at multi-gun nationals. I remember, I think it was our second stage we shot. I I threw down a great raw time. It was like top three of the match raw time. And I was like, oh, this is amazing. And I got one FTN, so five seconds. And it dropped me from like, it was either third or fifth overall in the match to like 54th. Wow. I was like, oh, God, this is different. What have I done? <laughs> <laughs> but that was a, uh, a big learning experience there for sure. And then it was the same even at that match drew because there was a, a weird long range section where i thought i could be a cool guy and reverse kneel these 400 yard targets on the clock and this and that and there was a bunch of them and matt and drew both destroyed me on it and they're like go prone yeah like i was like but it's gonna be slow going prone they're like hitting targets is not slow if you sit there reverse kneel missing if there's more than like three targets go prone dude and, i i've I've been goaded into that one so many times. Like, this is a perfect barricade for double kneel or reverse kneel. Like, I'm, I could hit this all day long because, like, in, in practice, it, there's no time pressure. There's, you know, all the time in the world to get set up. And in your head, you're not you're not trying to rush yourself like you are in a stage. Yeah, no adrenaline. Yeah, no adrenaline, nope. no cocktail. No one's no one's looking at you. There's nothing on the line. So it's, it's easy to go up, take that, you know, double kneel or reverse kneel position, make that hit and go where you do it on <laughs> the clock <laughs> and it's like yeah maybe i should have went prone right there for yeah. that 600 yard target yeah i've done that before and it's like oh i know i could do this all day or whatever and i go up and i'm like miss 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 what have i done <laughs> yeah so so how do you balance that then um how, as, as you're walking through if, if you don't have a mat and a drew sitting on either shoulder 
telling you what the right way to do it is how do you judge like uh what type of position you need to uh to take for like a long range shot like that you know it's funny that uh sometimes i'll do that with myself and not having a matter drew there again because like i said i look up to those guys and they they taught me a lot you know i'll go what would matt and drew do yeah like i've literally said that you know and i don't i don't think i consciously think about that as much anymore but even going through stages walking with through with some other shooters um i definitely realize that if there's if there's an opportunity to go prone and there's more than like one or two targets, I'm going prone. Mm-hmm. You know, if it's one target and, you know, I can build some kind of pretty stable position, I'm probably going to do that. But uh, for the most part, if there's more than like three targets and I have the opportunity to go to prone, I'm going to prone. Mm-hmm. And But if there's – do you have like a, a distance you, you think about that as? Like if it's a 300 yard to 400 yard, I'm going to go prone or – Well, not necessarily, because even I think in the past, especially this past year, we were seeing more scaled long range. Yeah, for sure. Where, you know, it's 100 yard or 200 yard, but it's a, you know, a little four inch auto popper, which are very difficult targets. Yeah. So I I don't think it's necessarily distance anymore. I think it's, you know, target to target. Yeah, those uh, those little auto poppers that um, we colloquially call skinny Sammies, those have been eating my lunch, man. Those are difficult especially when they're not painted and they're in weeds. I feel like I don't give them enough respect. And uh, <laughs> uh, Kurt Gruber gave me a hard time at uh, the uh, Texas Three Gun Championship because uh, he listened to my match recon, and I'm like, yeah, there's a skinny Sammy. It was like 55 yards, gave me a whole lot of trouble, and blah, 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 blah. And uh, I get a text the next day after that comes out, and he's like, that skinny Sammy was 80 yards. That's why he couldn't hit <laughs> it. <laughs> <laughs> and so – like I realize, like I don't give them enough respect to the point where I don't even bother seeing what actual distance they are. Like that's how much I disrespect those targets, and it, it came back to bite me in the butt like many times this year. Uh, yeah, that that sounds about right. I've done that before <laughs> on a stage where um, fifty yard again it was the skinny Sammies, mm-hmm. but it, you know I don't even think it was fifty yards. I think it was like forty yards in a bay, and it was one of those things like, oh, you can brace off this wall. But you got to shoot these four and then run up and do all this other stuff. I'm like, oh, I mean, we're, we're 40 yards. That's offhand all day. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's one of those things where you pull up on the first one. It's like tink, tink, and then miss, 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 yep. miss, 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 miss. You're like, I just went one for one on the first two. Now I've shot seven. Like, what happened? Yeah. And then hit that one. And go and say, if you lose that respect for a target, it's usually going to eat you. Yeah. They... <laughs> It reminds me of uh, the Colorado Three Gun Championship, which we're going to talk about in a minute. Here, we're going to do a match recon on that one, so uh, folks can uh, can listen along if if you're interested in that kind of stuff. Um, there was a, and this is the first time I had seen it, a rifle uh, Texas Star, mm-hmm. right? And it, we were shooting from like a wobbly bridge, and I want to say it was like the it was like one yard beyond the minimum safe distance. So like what forty six something like that. Yeah, something in there. It's pretty close, and and it was with a rifle, and it's you're starting off, so you're 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 not having to do anything else before you do that. So your heart rate's not all jacked. Like you're calm, you're in your stable position. Buzzer goes, and you mount the rifle, and ding 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 ding. Right, or you could brace off like the rail of the uh, of the bridge. You know, and I, I guess I, I recognized that and I knew that those were two different options. And I was thinking like, you know, I could totally hit that all day long offhand, but I went and I did the, what would Drew <laughs> say kind of thing. <laughs> and I was like, nah, I gotta, I gotta take a knee and, and, uh, and get on the, the side of the bridge. And so I did that. And then, uh, later on I watched uh, Casey Ryan, uh, like a video of his and, it was just buzzer, and he mounted the rifle, and ding, 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 and he was off. I was like, shit, I should have done that. <laughs> Kicking myself later, but I'm no Casey Ryan. But but that's well, uh, the whole thing. It's, uh, man, if you dry fire it, man, it's, I tell people like all the time, when I when I dry run, like mm-hmm. do a walkthrough, I'm like, man, if I could just shoot it this fast, it seems so easy right now. Yeah, exactly. And I'm like, I did the same thing, though. I looked at that exact same target. I was like, man, I know that I can offhand this. I know I can. What did I do? I went on the rail. Absolutely. Nice. Absolutely. I, as soon as the buzzer went off, I dropped to the rail. Because especially, well, and that, that was actually my very first stage of the match. Oh, okay. So uh, that was one of those things. Played a little bit safe. Like, 
don't do anything catastrophically dumb here. <laughs> <laughs> save until the second or third stage to yeah, do that. <laughs> yeah, save that for later. Uh huh. <laughs> but uh, that's what I did. I, and that's what pretty much all of us did. A couple guys mm-hmm. tried to shoot it off hand hand makeup shots. And that's one of the things. And I think with more experience, and that's one of the things like um, when you talk to Daniel Horner, one of the things that I really recognize with him, and I definitely am not to that level, is that when you talk to him, you know, he says, Oh, three steps takes me 1.2 seconds to draw the pistol takes quarter of a second to Mm -hmm. fire three shots takes this, this. I mean, he has everything down to a 10th of a second, what every little thing does. Yeah. So when he walks a stage and he runs through the scenarios, he, he knows like what his stage time is going to be. It's, it's eerie. It's weird. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but the thing that I start to think about more is like, all right, so standing and shooting offhand versus dropping, you know, kneeling and shooting off the rail is standing there and shooting it offhand faster if you go one for one? Yes. Okay. If you have two makeup shots, just two, it's faster to go to the rail if you shoot it one for one. Oh, uh-huh, yeah. It's true. So that's, you know, trying to help my consistency and getting a little bit more of that experience. You have to shoot to your own capability. That's one of the things we talk about with new shooters all the time. Um, when squatted, you know, we squatted with a lot of new shooters. And I tell them, like, you're going to watch me shoot a stage and – that may not be the way you want to shoot it. It's not anything against you, but my skill set is a little bit different. And it's the same thing. If you're somebody that's very strong pistol shooter, like, you know, even, you know, Bob Crow start, you know, he's shooting some three gun. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, it's one of those things where it's, let's say it's and a- Bob Crow's a USPSA uh, grandmaster. Yeah. World champion. World how champion. many times? And, very tall man. Yeah. I mean, he's- He's a pistol legend. Mm-hmm. And if you have a shotgun pistol option, uh, course of fire, you know, for him, obviously the pistol is the way to go. Right. Like, and especially, you know, say it, let's say it's got a 30 yard plate rack. You know, for most people, it's, it's going to be a better option to shoot a, a shotgun there for Bob Crow. Go pistol. Right. You know, you have to shoot to your capabilities and what your strengths are. Mm-hmm. So, and, and there's a, there's several people like that you know, that, that are like, you know, pistol masters, pistol grandmasters. And then when, uh, when you put them on the shotgun, they look like, you know, a baby deer (laughs) trying to walk, you know, but, um, but the, the concept of like playing to your strengths is, is huge. And, and, you know, you mentioned it, we squad with a lot of new shooters when, when we're shooting like local matches and you're squatted with new shooters, how do you help them figure out what their strengths are? I think, for them when you're i think that one well as you shoot with them you're going to see what their strengths are i mean because most of the time we're roing and obviously if i'm roing a new shooter i'm going to be watching what they're doing um based on that after a few stages you know sometimes i can you know provide a little insight if they want it some don't want it um and then and that that's a tough thing too is dealing with that ego for someone you know yeah yeah uh, how old you forest do you mind me asking uh how old am i that's a good question <laughs> 30 i just turned 34 34 hey Yay. congratulations <laughs> you're alive still uh so 34 years old there's times where we'll have like a new shooter out there who's mid 50s mm-hmm. and may have been you know shooting longer than you've been alive may have been uh prior military service hunting for years whatever there's some ego that comes along with that. Yep, so, yeah, absolutely. So how do you break through that ego and, you know, respectfully say, Hey, look, dude, <laughs> you suck at pistol mm-hmm. or, but how do you say that in a nice way? My usual thing is just strip asking me, Hey, you know, would you like a little advice or can I give you some advice or something like that? And just, you know, it's a simple question. If they're like, you know, I've had people tell me, no, you know, it's, I'm just doing what I'm doing. I'm like, okay. As long as it's not safety wise, you know, you want to do what you want to do. That's fine. And then, you know, the vast majority of people are receptive to it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I mean, I think, um, I think it's very typical for a lot of us in the community to be kind of a type personality and stubborn and opinionated and arrogant and all those yeah, things. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> there's, there's a lot of names that could be associated with, you know, the type of people that usually shoot. But then again, a little bit off subject, but there are, 
a lot of other words that can be associated with most of the people here. They're, you know, die hard loyal. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Very, very honest. Most of us are unfiltered, bluntly honest. <laughs> <laughs> but, but also with a, uh, with like a familial generosity as well, you know, like I've, yeah. I've borrowed rain gear coats when I screwed up and didn't bring a, a coat cause you know, it's October in Colorado and it's cold for some reason. Um, you know, just people will, will do everything they can to help you. And, and that's like a cool thing to, uh, to be a part of. And then, you know, turn around and try to show the same generosity that, you know, like all the, the Mike Griswolds and the John Beasley's and everybody that helped us along the way to show them that sort of generosity back. Yeah, absolutely. And I know that I've heard it on your podcast before and then I'm sure I've heard it countless times, but it's, it rings true every time, you know, being involved in a lot of other high level sports and competition, there is no other competition that I've been involved with at this level where literally I would hand gear or advice to my direct competition so that they do better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that is pretty much without fail that I've seen. There's a couple exceptions, but for the most part, you know, it's like I could be competing against a person for the overall match win and his pistol's messing up or he has wrong ammo or didn't bring ammo up. And that person will hand you whatever you need to compete to your top so that it's a legitimate, you know, win or loss. Yeah. I've, I literally have lent my gun out before and gotten beat with it. <laughs> 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 but that's, uh, that's just part of the community. I mean, it's a very tight knit community. Right. So then, so three years into it and you're kind of turning around doing the, the mentoring thing for the, uh, the newer shooters that are coming in already. Like what, what are some like commonalities you see of people coming in that want to shoot through the gun that want to, uh, be a part of like the, uh, the Colorado club match scene? Oh man. You know, that's, uh, there's so many personalities. That's kind of, <laughs> <laughs> that's a pretty broad, broad, uh, topic. I think, um, the thing we see, you know, there are definitely people, I mean, there's, there's guys that started shooting last year locally. They're now are competing nationally and doing very well mm -hmm. that take it very serious. And there's people that I know that have been shooting way longer than I have locally. It's still just a fun thing to do on the weekend. So I think a lot of what that depends on is what the people want to have and what their mindset is. Mm -hmm. um, some of us are very competitive <laughs> 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 and want to win as much as we can and push to do so. Uh, and some people are just going to look and going out just to have fun. So yeah. I, I think that really depends. Uh, I think training wise and ability wise, most of the new shooters is, and I think we all see it. There's a lot of the, um, I don't want to say myths, even though I think a lot of them are myths mm -hmm. of how to handle your guns, like from the tactical background. Mm, yeah. We were talking about that earlier. Yeah. Things like that where, you know, a lot of people think it's cool to muzzle yourself and every direction and muzzle other people regardless. Right. Because that's what the tactical guys do, you know, and there's a time and in place. a real life situation. Yeah. You're not going to worry about muzzle discipline. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> ah, you know, if, if we're going through a door and you're, you're behind me, I, I, I hope you still have some muzzle discipline. Yeah, exactly. And some, I don't want that you, barrel in my back. Yeah. Some trigger finger discipline. Yeah. So some things definitely apply still. So I think new shooter wise, it's, it's that. And then a lot of new shooters, um, get ahead of themselves. They try to go too fast, too soon, mm -hmm. make mistakes, or there's just, you know, the mental part of it and speeding your mind up and processing is a huge part of shooting. And that's saying I still, every time I shoot, I, I try to work on those things and learn from that is speed my mind up. I never want to slow down. Right. I just want to speed up my mental processing. And you know, that that's one thing that I've noticed is the stages that I've done the best on are not the stages where I think like, wow, I'm going really fast right now. You know, those are the stages where I end up like falling on my face or, <laughs> or, or uh, uh, you know, doing something else, uh, you know, incorrectly or running past a target or something like that. Um, finding that I didn't even hit a paper target that was seven yards away. So w the smoothness, I guess, is is where it's at. And like that old saying, slow is smooth, smooth is fast. Like I hate that saying because, you know, like Kalani Laker pointed out on the podcast, like slow is slow, right? So how do you um, train for 
speeding yourself up and and keeping your you know not only your mechanics up to a fast level but your your mental processing like you're saying like i know you do a lot of training or at least i assume you do in, <laughs> based on what we've talked about but how how do you train for that speed well and actually that's one of the things that for this off season and next year that i really want to address is that um actual practice i do very little of which i need to correct what i, I completely lie to me no it's <laughs> my you know I shoot. I shot thirty three local matches this season. That's a lot of matches. It's a lot of matches, and those are my practice. But I, you know, and, and I think there's good and bad about that. I like the idea of the local match that you're getting the the adrenaline, the push. You know, there's the competitive drive there to train you to do things correctly on the clock with the pressure. On the counter side of that, I don't think. I personally don't think that you learn as much while competing, you know, because there's times where before the clock, I'm like, okay, on this run, focus strictly on trigger press and front sight. Mm -hmm. And when the buzzer goes off and I just go start shooting, <laughs> none of that happens. And afterwards, like when I miss a pistol arc, I'm like, did you see the front sight? Mm -hmm. No, you didn't train that. Like, So that's one of the things that I'm, you know, like I said, with consistency wise, I think um, I'm going to have to, I'm looking at correcting, <laughs> uh, getting, that's one of the things that I really want to focus on is getting a good practice routine. Mm -hmm. I've struggled with that and I want to remedy it. Uh, I just need to figure out how I'm going to do that. I don't have a hundred percent plan yet. <laughs> it's in the works though. <laughs> <laughs> you at least but, have the piece of paper and the pencil and now you just need to write it down, right? Yeah. You know, and, um, part of the problem for me and, um, I think there's reasons for things. I try not to make excuses for things, mm -hmm. but you know, working a full time job, and then part of the problem is where we're at in my area, at least. My the closest outdoor range is 45 minutes away. Right. So it makes it difficult for me to get out and go do practice with that stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, I have an indoor range close, extremely nice one, but there's only so much that I can do there and mentally do there without losing focus. Um, and same thing in dry fire. I've been trying to dry fire more. Um, but I'm, I'm still trying to figure out my routine for that. Right. of What benefits me and what honest dry fire is. Cause I can call, I can call great hits all day, dry fire, <laughs> but, and that's, you know, it's again, it's, this is my third season of shooting. I haven't been shooting that long. There's still a lot that I'm learning. Right. Um, I try, to learn every match I go to. And part of that is, is, you know, honest dry fire, how to make that really happen. And then I'm trying to figure out a way to get actually on the range more mm -hmm. and figure out a way to have ammo for that. Yeah, for sure. You know, that's uh that is a difficult thing to come up with is how to, you know, how to come up with an extra thousand rounds a week or whatever it is to go out and do live fire. Cause there's like, for me, one of the things that I later in this season, I really wanted to, um, better was my, my speed on the trigger and my cadence where I found myself like even, you know, it's five yard open paper targets with a rifle mm -hmm. and I'm shooting faster splits with my pistol. Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, this is a rifle. I have two hands on it. It has no recoil. There's, you know, everything's there. Like every target should be just double click, mm -hmm. just ta ta. And I'm like, pop pop i'm like why am i trying to line up a zone <laughs> things on every one of these like in in my mind when i'm shooting it feels you know slow it feels like right. pop pop you know you watch the video and it yeah it it's it seems a lot quicker but that's uh that's still one of the things i'm trying to figure out is how to pick up that cadence and that the mental focus stuff i think uh, my opinion at least a lot of that is just experience yeah um i talked to ron avery about that i did a, a class with him earlier this year and that was one of the things I talked about is we talk about a lot is mental focus and how to try to speed up your mental processing. And a lot of that is, is just doing it. Once it clicks, once you, uh, really experience it, I think from there, it's a lot easier to recognize and learn from, uh, the thing I always associate with, and not everybody will get it. Like when you, when you learn to snowboard, um, like you'll catch edges, catch edges, keep falling, keep falling, keep falling. It's like, okay, you got to, 
you know, you have to do this, have to do this, this, and you do it once you get it right. And you're like, and you feel what it feels like to do a correct turn on a snowboard. And you're like, Oh, that's what that feels like and looks like and how it feels. Now I can repeat that. So I think that's part of the process. But like you were saying, when, uh, when you can make everything subconscious, mm-hmm. you know, where you're not thinking about, all right, trigger press, trigger press, do this, right. do that. Front and side, it, front side. Yeah, and it's just happening. Mm-hmm. Like you're letting it happen and you're focusing on, all right, this target, this target, this target. That's when it comes in. And the same thing talking to Ron, it's all of those things should be pre-programmed and be subconscious. If you're thinking about that, that's mental capacity that you shouldn't be using on that, that you're having to refocus. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that's a good point. Like um to uh to build upon that, I shot with uh Jerry Mitchell like um 2016 at Gen 3 gun. And uh when he was done with a stage, um I was like, "How'd that go?" And he's like, "Oh, I started thinking out there. Once you start thinking, it's all over." <laughs> <laughs> and, and then he walked off and I was like, "Okay, I better write that down because I'm sure there was something I should learn in there." But uh it took me a while to uh to like completely understand what he was he was talking about but you know i've i experienced that a couple times this year of of uh you know being excited about how well a plate rack was going or frustrated on how a quad was going in and then i start just running through you know stuff in your head of like okay well now i gotta hurry up on this and now i gotta do this and it's like why am i not hitting this you gotta change your magazine you know that sort of thing and those are all things that you shouldn't be thinking about you should just be executing right in that flow state. Yeah. That should be completely subconscious. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, it's funny. Either way. It's funny that you mentioned Jerry and his wisdom. So I think it was my first season. I think it was actually at pandemic, my first major. Okay. Mm-hmm. And uh, Jerry was there and I was awestruck <laughs> <laughs> as was he. Oh, <laughs> yeah, obviously. <laughs> but, uh, I uh, I was I just had a few minutes and I think we were I don't remember, I, it was between stages and I was like hi Jerry how's it going you know blah 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 and we were talking for a minute and I was like yeah I'm I'm just trying to figure this out it's my first major he's like do you want to know the secret to winning and I'm like here's Jerry Mitchell like, he's gonna tell me the <laughs> secret I'm like yes like I've got a like my phone's out recording like I've got somebody else <laughs> dictating in the back like I've got like crayons and things Wes, like take a note yeah like I'm writing everything down like this is it like golden Cray- tablet stuff crayons and uh he looks at me straight I'm like yes it's about to happen and he's like shoot fast don't miss walks away just mic drop walks away I'm like <laughs> how do I do that <laughs> 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 yeah, I you know uh the game is simple. It's not easy, but it's very simple. Yeah, I mean th- that's true. I mean, what he said is completely true. How to do that? That's a whole yeah, other story. Exactly. <laughs> just just bake a good cake and the cake will be good. Yeah, right. So, that's for everybody out there, pro tip. You yep. know, shoot, shoot fast, fast, don't, don't miss. miss. Yeah, it's a secret. Yeah. Don't ask me how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. You know the uh when you talk about like training options here in Colorado, I I, I can totally relate, right? Because so we're in we're in Lakewood, Colorado, Three Gun Show World Headquarters, and Prestige Worldwide. <laughs> <laughs> and if you uh, if you travel west, you're going to be able to uh, ski and snowboard. But if you go north, south, or east, there are three pretty good ranges that you can go to. Four four good ranges you can go to, but uh, none of them are within two hours of here. Yeah. I mean, even so locally, like we talked about, I shoot a lot of local matches. Mm -hmm. Um, I drive a lot. And you live in Loveland? Loveland. Is that right? Yep. So Weld is my home range. That's my closest range. That's about 45 minutes away. 45 minutes away without idiot Colorado drivers Mm -hmm. from probably from Texas or California. (laughs) Um, Got a funny story about that. Yeah. (laughs) And other than that, I mean, all of my drives are over two hours, you know, and it's, uh, those can make for some long days, but that's just, it's funny when I talk to people from other areas, especially, you know, in Texas now, Missouri now, Oklahoma, like mm-hmm. matches are popping up everywhere. And they're like, oh yeah, that, that match is 10 minutes from my house. I'm like, 10 minutes? You got that range 10 minutes from your house? Like, oh my God, I'm so jealous. Yeah. Whereas, you know. It's crazy. My matches, it's funny because even 
like socially and everything, people are like, oh, you know, let's go out tonight, blah, 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 on a Saturday night. I'm like, well, tomorrow is SoCo, you know, Sunday SoCo, and I have to get up at 3 a.m. I have to drive two oh. and a half to three hours, go shoot the match, and then, it, you know, it gets done at 6 p.m. or whatever, and then we go get some dinner and then drive back, and I'm home at 10 p.m., and I got to go to work. And this yeah. is like, so going out Saturday nights out on that weekend, I'm like, <laughs> yeah that that's the uh the worst part about shooting three gun in my estimation is how damn early you have to get up to do it yeah <laughs> well in getting up earlier doesn't bother me so much i'm an early riser um we all talk about it i there's a lot of times i hate how long it takes to run a match but yeah. that is just part of the game right now mm-hmm. and i accept that um but do I wish we could do that a little bit differently? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah um, so being back here in Colorado and, and uh, re, re, uh, remaking Colorado my home, I've tried to figure out which range is going to be like my home range where I can go, you know, during the week and practice and, and um, do uh, teaching and things like that. And uh, I've, uh, I've settled on Ben Lamont gun range and uh, I went out recently for a training session with our buddy Chad Torres. And I think it was a Wednesday. It took me two hours and 15 minutes to get there. And I mean, it was unreal. Like I had to leave so freaking early to, uh, to get there when, when Chad and I were supposed to meet up and I'm like, Oh, okay, well we can't make it nine o'clock because then I'll hit all the Denver traffic. Can't make it 10 o'clock because then I'll hit all the Denver traffic. Can't make it 11 o'clock because I'll hit all the... So we got to make it like 8 o'clock. And so then you leave at like 5.30 and still show up late. It's 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 a challenge here. And it then, is. And then when you talk about, you know, indoor ranges, like you can shoot straight and that's it. Yeah. Can't run around. Yep. Yeah. And, you know, it's, some of them are better where they'll let you draw and things like that. But um, definitely for what we do. Mm-hmm. I, I prefer to get out on an outdoor, you know, yeah. active range. Yeah, you know, it's <laughs> I went to uh, an indoor range recently with a uh, student, and there's a dude next to us that's just like slinging rounds down range out of everything, and then find out later they're like rental guns. It was like, bro, you didn't even need to put paper out there because you like weren't <laughs> even aiming or anything. Like he had like a uh, like a rental forty five and an M one, uh, and or M fourteen. I don't know. It was three hundred eight something or other, and it's like. This is almost like detri- uh, detrimental, like walking us back. Is like, how do you speak to a student and like ingrain trigger control when there's this just kablam, kablam? It's like, bro, we're on like a 25 yard range and you're shooting a 308. What, yeah. What's going on here, dude? That's it's the worst thing in the world. Like, I'll try to go, you know, me, like we said, tinkering with my stuff so much. I'll be in the indoor range mm-hmm. trying to zero my rifle, and there's a dude <laughs> next to me with a 300 Win Mag. Like, yeah, Ow! I'm like, oh my god. <laughs> That's when, like, I take, I just slide my rifle a little bit further so the muzzle breaks out there, <laughs> and just start doing a few triple taps or take whatever. That. Yep, like having a little muzzle blast. <laughs> <laughs> How do you like it? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, they're definitely. T- well, you know, the indoor range close to my there, that Liberty Firearms Institute is mm-hmm. ten minutes from my house, which that's awesome. That place is amazing. The place has the most competition gear I've ever seen at a local gun store that's because a three gun guy is the <laughs> purchasing manager well, yeah that helps <laughs> yeah <laughs> well that and that i mean that's probably the premier indoor range in the country right now is it yeah i mean it's 52 indoor lanes four thousand square feet of retail space it's like a year and two months old or something e- year and a half maybe yeah it's i think it's almost two now because mm-hmm. earlier this summer was the one year anniversary oh okay yeah so but yeah, that place is, that, I mean, it's awesome, but still it's, uh, and I'm a member there. So I try to go in and I shoot my, my dot drills with my pistol and things like that. And those are like, if you're going to shoot at the indoor range and, and shoot static, basically, I don't, I personally don't think there's any better thing you can do than to shoot the dot drills. Right. Yeah. There's so much stuff you can do with them and they will, those will make you a better pistol shooter. They really will. Um, my the hard part for me is that you know I'm used to three gun and running around like a banshee and doing cool stuff and then <laughs> to stand you know at the five yard line in indoor range and poke holes at block three quarter inch dots is for me mentally is it's hard to stay focused. Yeah, for sure. But yeah, I I used to shoot with a guy that um he said that he started out every 
training session with his uh, uh, 22 and a dime sized dot. And I, I don't know if he was like five, seven yards, something like that. But he said that his training session would not progress until he put all 10 rounds in the, uh, in the, you know, 22 Ruger, whatever he's got magazine on that dot. And he said, some days you, you only shoot one dot. Some days you go home pissed off and don't shoot any nine millimeter at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's probably a good, you know, a mental focuser though. Yeah, for sure. I mean, and that shows them that you know, we have all seen that where there's, there's days where it seems like you can't miss mm -hmm. and there's days where it seems like, like who put blanks in my gun? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, uh, Forrest, there's a couple, uh, um, couple questions I want to ask you that I ask all my guests and, uh, we'll get into those in a minute here, but, um, I don't know if we're supposed to talk about this, but I'm just going to assume it's okay. There are two ranges in Colorado that are getting big berms built 400 to 600 yard berms and they're going to be practical berms and right now in colorado the farthest that we can shoot in a match is 200 yards and there's several times where we don't shoot past 100 yards yep i feel like that's going to significantly change like the face of of three gun in colorado and like the the uh, level of shooter that we have to be able to shoot local matches out to 600 yards or 400 yards, depending on what range you're at. What do you think about that? Uh, I'm all for it. And I have had conversations with those, you know, <laughs> with said match directors <laughs> and uh, I am all for it. Um, I think the fine line and the, uh, the balance that we have all spoken about many times is how do we make three gun matches challenging and fun and, you know, skill builders for higher level competitors mm -hmm. and how do we keep new shooters and just hobby shooters keep coming back to those matches because that's the that's one of the hard parts you start throwing in four and five hundred yard targets in local matches which you know for me i'm all for because i don't get to shoot those and then i show up to a national and they're like oh yeah there's a i need inch plate of 500 yards have fun i'm like I'm going to hit it, but yeah. uh, I don't feel confident about it. And I'm probably <laughs> going to shoot more at it than I should. I'm, you know, I, I felt that way. My, my very first uh, match outside of Colorado, which was in Texas. And I want to say that the longest shot there was like four, four fifty or something like that. But, um, but then, you know, I go to like a local match, you know, dissident arms, three gun and, in uh college station. And they're like, yeah, we're not shooting too far today. Uh, four thirties are farthest target right <laughs> okay <laughs> coming from where i come from like that's more than double what we can actually shoot yeah that's a poke yeah you know it's uh ah, whoa i'm hitting stuff Jeez, dude rookie right here <laughs> <laughs> um no like we said though it's i'm all for it um i look forward to it mm -hmm. but I, I think we're gonna have to figure out how to probably balance things out a little bit yeah i'm not sure how we'll probably just have to make the penalties where they're worth going for mm -hmm. but they're not going to destroy some of the other people yeah so i've thought about this a lot too because uh this is a conversation i've had a lot with match directors all over the country is like how do you um create a match that's challenging for your best shooters but also makes your your core or not your core, but maybe your your large majority of hobbyists, like you said, weekend warriors, come out and want to shoot it. You know how how do you keep that balance? And maybe maybe you do like divisions or cl not cl divisions classes like uh, A class, B class, something like that. Yeah, you know, I that's one of the things that we have talked about is that if you start splitting up into kind of some skill level, I mean. And that's one of the things that I've actually heard from a lot of newer shooters. And I um, I encountered that when I first started getting into three-gun and shooting nationally where, you know, I was a first- or second-year shooter and, you know, shooting against Jerry Michalik in, you know, same division or shooting mm -hmm. against Keith Garcia in the same division. Mm -hmm. um, I like competing, per, you know, personally, I like competing against the best. That's why I shoot TAC. Like, and that's one of the things where – Take that, Wes. <laughs> um, <laughs> he doesn't listen to these. It's fine. Yeah, right. The uh, and it's one of the things. There's extremely good shooters in limited and in open and of all divisions. The top shooters and all those are extremely good shooters. But if you want to go to where all you know 
the best considered shooters in the world are, mm -hmm. they play in tack. And that's where I want to play, even though I could get some better, you know, match finishes shooting a different division. Um, I want to compete with the best, mm -hmm. whether, you know, and say, I'm, I'm okay with getting beat. I just want to go and compete yeah. with the best. Yeah. So, but like you say, you know, for local wise, I think that's kind of a good thing too, because, you know, obviously I'm no Keith Garcia, mm -hmm. but locally, you know, the vast, you know, I'll go out and win the vast majority of local events, mm -hmm. you know, or be right there. Top one, two, three. Um, and for some, like a new shooter that's on the squad will come up and shoot, you know, on the same one as me. And they're like, well, how am I supposed to compete against you? I'm like, well, don't worry about competing against me. Like, that's not technically what you're doing. Yeah. I mean, it's. Well, yeah. and so this is, this is something that I struggle with a lot and, and I don't get it because like I've, I've done, um, a ton of five K's I've done a lot of, or I've, I've done, I did one half marathon and that was enough for me to realize <laughs> I don't like doing that. And I've done a ton of, uh, obstacle races. I've never won any one of them and I've never gone away pouting, you know, thinking like, Oh, I'm never going to run a Spartan race again because I didn't win. Like that guy that runs every day won. screw him. Yeah. Well, he runs every day. Exactly. That's, that's my point is like, we all have different, uh, priorities and, and resources and goals in life. So what is it about three gun that, that makes people shy away if they can't win their first match. I think it's ego. Boom. It has to be. It's got to be. You know, and it's one of those things, like I said before, where I think a lot of us can be described with singular words, some good, some not so good. <laughs> um, and even with myself, you know, it's I'm extremely competitive. I know that. Mm -hmm. I can I can be stubborn. You know, I can be opinionated. I know all these things. Mm -hmm. But my personality also is that I love competing. I love to compete. It doesn't matter what it is. It's like a joke of friends and family with me. I can't have a hobby. Every hobby I have turns into a full tilt, like second <laughs> job competing. Yeah. It doesn't matter what it is. There's a long list of them. Nice. Um, <laughs> but I could tell you, though, like Three Gun has kept me in, you know, stimulated and interested in wanting to progress longer than just about any of them mm -hmm. because every time I think I'm, you know, like getting to that next level and like I find something else that just takes me down right? that I want to get better at. Mm -hmm. But that's my personality. Not everybody's like that. And some people, when they get kicked, they, uh, they like to curl up in a ball on the ground for a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's got to help them up. So, but so then – Two, que I, two questions. One, how, how does a person, if they're listening to this and maybe they go to their first match, they get frustrated, how do they deal with that? And then second, how can we as um, uh, stewards for our sport help people deal with that? Well, I think I think part of it is is that the people, when they do go to the match and they don't do so good, Again, though, I think that varies a lot with your personality. Mm -hmm. You know, um, there's the people like me that when I get beat, I'm going to, you know, I'll go ask questions like, mm -hmm. hey, why did you do this? Hey, why did this happen? Like, why did I get beat so bad here? Because I want to get better. Um, some people just aren't like that. Yeah. <laughs> but I do, I do think it's one of those things where if you want to compete, and this is a, don't get down in this sport. If you're a new shooter and you go out and you get beat, you know, or you do poorly your first match, don't get down. Like the resources to help you get better are absolutely there. Mm -hmm. The, the people are willing to help you. People are willing to give you gear. You know, if you want to get better, the resources are there. I mean, it's even the same thing. Um, we talk about our buddy, Chad, Chad has only been shooting now for a year and he is, become a very good shooter yeah yeah I, I shot uh i shot in a squad behind chad last year hard as hell and i was i was thinking like um man this was a tough match to choose for your first match right but and, but he is also one of the guys that well is a high you know he is a very high competitive drive and yeah. wants to do good so let me finish that story so went to dinner with chad and talking to him about what he does in his professional life uh, he has like you were saying that drive 
and that like tenacity, you know, and he's not like a meek personality. Right. And so then this year when I shot with him at the Colorado three gun championship, cause we both shot at the, on the RO squad, I was like, who in the F is this guy? Like what, what did you do while I was gone? Like I was, dude, last time I saw you was December. It's freaking July. What did you do? You know, like he's, he's progressed so quickly, but it's, it's the work he puts in, you know, yeah. and, and you get what you put into the game for sure. Well, and saying he's a great example because, um, I think it was his first or second match that he ever shot. We were squatted together. It was at Ben Loman. Um, and he was one of those guys where he didn't do very good in the match, but he asked a lot of questions and he was very receptive. So same thing. Like I was, me and him were talking a lot I'm like, Hey dude, look at this. Let's walk through together. Let's build a stage plan together. And then he was, and he was very straight up about, Hey, you know, what do you think I can improve on here and here and here? And when he came in, he was, his pistol shooting was awesome. He had a very tactical, uh, posture. <laughs> he's a very big turtle, <laughs> but I was just he didn't say tactical turtle. Oh, he's a very big turtle. This is a big man. Yeah. And, uh, moves really fast for a large man. He moves very fast for a large man. He surprises a lot of people. Yeah. But, um, that was the same thing though. He had the personality to do better and say like, Hey, you know, you know, you did this better to me. What, you know, what can I do? What do you think about this? What do you think about that? And I say the resources are absolutely there. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. now like say Chad is quickly becoming a very good shooter. He's poured himself into the sport Mm -hmm. he has and he wants to keep progressing. Um, and I think he will, but I say if you're a new shooter and you're discouraged, Try not to get, try not to get discouraged. Same thing. I got destroyed my first few matches. Yeah. Um, but if you want to be, you know, a competitor in the sport, just ask questions and keep coming back. If you keep coming back, you're going to get better. And especially if you have a lot of good shooters in your area, you're going to get better fast. I mean, there's a few places, um, Northern California right now, there's a couple shooters coming out of there that have recently started shooting that, because of the guys they're shooting around mm-hmm. have become extremely good, extremely fast. Yeah. I mean, it's, well, you, you know, um, it, it's a very good point. And several of my guests have said like, you know, choose people that you squad with well and, um, squad with better shooters. And I noticed that when I was in Texas, I would, you know, go shoot a local match or a club match and you couldn't pick a bad squad. Like there was so many good people, shooting at each club that you're like, okay, well (laughs) I guess I could just flip a coin here and then find a good squad to be with. And like, that's pretty cool when you have like a club with several strong shooters that they can, you know, put you on any squad and you can go learn something. Yeah. You can feed off of. Yeah, absolutely. That's one of the things I've thought about. I've, we've talked about before where, uh, man, if you were, let's say you're a USPSA pistol shooter and Mm -hmm. you're getting into it and you decide that you want to be really good Mm -hmm. and let's like, you know, the world's perfect and this and that you want to be the best shooter you can be like you say, okay, I'm going to move down to Arizona and I'm going to go shoot at Rio Salada. Yep. I'm going to make Rio Salada my home range. Yep. I can guarantee you that you, if you shoot at Rio Salada for a year as a pistol shooter, one, you're either going to quit because you've gotten beat <laughs> so bad or you're going to be like a grandmaster within a year. Yeah. I can pretty much guarantee you that because the level of average shooter there is so high mm-hmm. that that's what it is. I mean, if you shoot there on a consistent basis and the average level shooter is a master, guess what? Yeah. You're, you're probably going to become a master pretty quick. Yeah. Um, or go start racing go-karts or something. Exactly. Or you're going to get out of the sport. I yep. think uh, – I think somebody mentioned that maybe from Rio Salado recently where they said the vast majority of their new shooters either progress very fastly and become a master or they quit. Huh. Interesting. And but do they but, have a now do they care about that? Because like our our local match directors here, they they seem to care a lot about the new shooters and want to to maintain them. And we have those conversations constantly on how we can keep new shooters. Well, getting back to the four hundred yard yeah. plus range. I think part of that, I think doing some divisions and maybe separating it a little bit, whether, you know, on a club level, I think would be good. I mean, you see that in so many other sports. There's Yeah, A class, B class, C class. Yeah, you see that everywhere. And it's good because one, yeah. it, it, like 
like everything, it gives you a ladder system to try to build. Mm -hmm. So as you jump up a tier, you know, you're competing against like-minded, like-skilled people. Mm -hmm. And then when you reach the top of that tier, you jump to the next tier. Now, when you jump to the next tier, maybe you're at the bottom of that tier. But guess what? Now you have a foreseeable, you know, obtainable goal. Yeah. And I think that helps develop the sport. Now, with the 400-yard things, we've had discussions about that. And I wonder... One of the big things that I talk about with three gun trying to keep matches and uh, stages challenging to you know higher level shooters and to new shooters I think is building in skill option is what I call it. So let's say you build a stage where if you have the skill to shoot a plate rack at fifty yards offhand, you don't have to run up thirty yards to shoot it from a supported position. Yes. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So like guys like me and, you know, whatever else, I'm going to like, whether I should or not, just for practice sake at a local, I'm going to shoot that offhand at 50. Yeah. And I'm not going to run up 30 yards. Mm -hmm. Will my stage time, you know, resemble that with probably, you know, several seconds less? Yes. But at the same time, if it's 50 yards and you put a barricade there that I can shoot off of, even though I should practice my offhand, if you put a barricade there, I shoot. I'm probably going to shoot off that barricade. <laughs> yeah. Like, same, yeah, same here, man. If everybody's shooting off the barricade, because right. that's the smart thing to do. Guess what? Well, and I still have that ego. Like I want to, I want to uh, beat Craig Hawkins, you know, yeah. and Lance Lazoff, you know. So that's one of the things that I fight a little bit, and I think a lot of us do with competitive drive. Is like, I talk about all the time. All right, locals are practice. This is where you go for things, mm -hmm. whether you win or lose. Like if you go for something and screw up and it costs you the match, it's no big deal. This is practice. Yeah. But I want to win, dude. I'm gonna. <laughs> I, I, I try not to do this on the on the podcast a lot, but I'm gonna toot my own horn real quick. So I did that at the uh, the AK prep match that we did in Weld County. You know, we had uh, so for for folks following along at home, Red October Kalashnikov Festival happens in October, obviously at um, uh, Sups Tactical Performance Center, whatever the name is. There's four of them, and. Um, you and Wes, right? Is it you and Wes? You guys decided to put this on, or who was it? Whose idea was this? Um, Drew and Wes officially did it, okay. and then I was kind of the third wheel on that. Gotcha. So Drew and Wes. So that that really fun swingy array in the back. That's that whole stage was me. All right, that's that's where my story centers on right there. So <laughs> so uh, that that match, it's an AK prep match, right? It's a, it's Colorado's AK match to prep for Red October for the people that are going to Red October. And for like our, our local dudes who, uh, you know, want to shoot their AK once a year. Right. So last year, uh, my understanding is there was like 30, some 40, whatever shooters this year, they added, uh, an AR division. Right. So let's, let's fill the match. And so I think there was like 30 AR shooters and, uh, one division AR open. Right. And so I'm shooting with, uh, our buddy, Nick Ingmar and our buddy, Chad Torres. Right. And, the uh the entire match we're just kind of like trading a, a second here and a second there and stuff like that and uh my squad our last stage is is on the uh on the back side with uh the stage that you designed with all the swingers like you kick a popper over and then there's multiple swingers activating and there's like a certain order you have to shoot them in a clamshell and stuff like that and then several other wide open targets through this this small little berm right and looking at that, like I'm, I'm not one of those people that like Daniel says, if I take two steps, it's this much time. But I looked at that and I was like, this is a fast stage. And so since we were so close through the entire match, like no one knows who's winning because it's a club match and practice score is not updated, but we're sitting there and I'm like messing with Nick and Chad. I'm like, you guys are going to have to break your triggers off on this one. Like you're going all out. Like you gotta, you gotta go for glory on this one. <laughs> and, uh, we, we did. And Nick, who'd been running 30 round magazines the entire time, because uh, he's like, nah, this is our screw around match, realized that, you know, now it's a thing. And so he goes and gets his D60. And then Chad is like, okay, I'm, I'm in. And then so Chad's, I, I want to say Chad was up first. Maybe he was up second or something like that. But Chad throws two rounds into a no shoot. And then Nick has a jam on his D60 that he hasn't used the entire match. And, <laughs> and, uh, and then, uh, I beat them both on that stage, but I actually ended up winning the match. And you go back and you look at the uh, the standings. Like I did not have a stellar performance. Like I 
I was like third to sixth on every stage, but I, but I ended up winning just by keeping that consistency and not letting the ego at the end. <laughs> <laughs> like I, I, I almost feel bad, but it's so funny. Like I totally got Nick's ego going and you know, we've laughed about this since and uh Chad too, but it's uh it's it's funny though like you let that ego take hold of uh of your shooting and and all of a sudden you just go out of your mind i don't know it, it sounds like in a way you kind of had the ego going there you're like <laughs> I, I know what i'm doing here i'm gonna burn this down and i'm gonna drive these guys to try to chase me yeah well you know it's it's funny because like uh maybe that is what i was doing but in my head like i had convinced myself i was just joking around just playing it cool yeah and, but maybe know. i was just really being a dick and pretending to joke <laughs> Hey, you saw the right thing with that stage, though. I mean, I designed yeah. that stage to be like you have to go full throttle. Yeah, and that and like I, even I that first array, I designed that like if you delay on that, you're going to be sitting yes. there waiting for that thing to come back around. Absolutely, I designed that thing to kick and get on the trigger and go. Mm -hmm. And and I don't even think I was in the top three of of that that stage. I want to say Landon got the uh, stage one on that one, and several other people were in front of me, but but. Just talk enough trash to Chad and <laughs> <laughs> he wings a no shoot. It was funny though. I actually wanted to make that stage a lot tighter with the walls. Mm -hmm. I wanted to make it almost kind of like a tactical thing where you had to like pull your rifle up and back, like moving in and out of the walls really tight. But then, then like Chad walked through it and I was like, that's a bull in the China shop, man. These little balls won't last. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, same thing, having new shooters there. Yeah. Again, it's and a lot of guys are shooting like 18 inch rifles and stuff. So yeah, it was the same thing. It's that's one of the things we battle with. Like, uh, I try to make things technical, mm -hmm. but I absolutely do not want to design something to DQ somebody. Right. You know, right. and then I try to even point out things that, you know, I don't want to say, you know, it was a 180 trap or DQ trap, mm -hmm. but I try to point those things out to her, like when I have new shooters on my squad, like specifically bring them up and point it out. Yeah. And even the same thing when I shot that shot that stage, I had a couple newer shooters on there and I was very specific with them about muzzle control. We had a very specific conversation on that stage because it would have been very easy to break 180 on that stage. Right. Yeah. But Yeah, absolutely. But that stage was a ton of fun. That was a ton of fun. Go really fast on that one. Yeah. That was a good one. All right. So you brought up DQ. Forrest, can you tell me about your most spectacular disqualification? God. And then we're going to ask what we can learn from it afterwards. Oh. This, it was very recent for me. It still stings. And I don't know this story, so I'm a little nervous. Yeah. Uh, it's It still stings a bit. My first DQ. Hard as hell multi-gun. Yeah, it was hard as hell just a couple weeks ago. Yeah. Um, it was absolutely legitimate DQ. I earned it. I don't didn't fight it. Didn't argue it. I earned it. Um, not to make an excuse. I do think there were some underlying things that I don't want to say made it imminent, but probably contributed. Con uh, contributed, but it was probably you know probably inevitable. <laughs> <laughs> so one of those things. So we all know hard as hell is a very physical match, and this mm -hmm. year in particular was extremely physical. Um, so if the day before you go to the match, if you have a hundred two degree fever, oh. If you can't breathe and you're like, you want to be a hard ass and say, <laughs> I'll push through it because there's like, I don't quit. That's like, I do not quit. And you still show up to the match. So it was uh, second day, second stage. Mm -hmm. So literally halfway through the match. I was actually shoot considering I was shooting pretty good considering that I couldn't breathe. Like I literally, I was struggling to breathe. I was coughing up blood. Oh my god! Are you kidding? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I was. I was getting some vertigo and like. Did, I, I did we shake hands when you came in? Probably. Damn it! I probably hugged you. <laughs> I might have grabbed your butt. <laughs> but uh, I was not in a good place, mentally or physically. And in hindsight, um, you know that's that's one of those things where realistically it was probably a little questionable what I was doing. And I even, I told my guys before that I was with, I was like, maybe even like, I know that I'm not in a good place right here. Keep an eye on me. If I start to do something like stupid or start to be unsafe, like just throw in the towel. Like mm -hmm. I'm, cause I know that, you know, me personally, I'm not going to quit myself, but it turns out I had pneumonia. <laughs> <laughs> but, all right. So, but, uh, 
so it was uh, stage two, the trench stage, mm-hmm. uh, shotgun, pistol, rifle. Um, sh- it was a technical stage two. It was a mixture of birdshot and slugs, uh, multiple mixtures. And then, oh. yeah. Good. And then, uh, more things to think about. Yeah. And then rifle and pistol and a lot of back and forth running through the trenches. Mm-hmm. Um, started with shotgun. I went through the shotgun. I finished shotgun. I turned my shotgun up and I had the muzzle and like the extension tube in the dump barrel. And I was like, Oh, I got to put my safety on. I reached over with my thumb to push the safety and hit the trigger instead of the safety. Oh, wow. Executed a barrel. Ouch. So, I just stopped. I'm like, Oh man, <laughs> especially at hard as hell. You don't have to put your safety on when you dump. Yeah. So, That's and odd. it was the RO on the stage was Ken Nelson. Right. And he was standing above me because we were in the trenches. I was like, well, Ken, that's why you say don't bother putting your safety on. I don't think I actually spoke that well because I couldn't breathe. But <laughs> <laughs> You thought it though, right? Yeah, that was – no, I, I did say it, but it, it probably didn't come out that well. <laughs> but I absolutely earned it. I, I messed up. And, yeah. That's a tough one. Yeah, and that's one of those things, like you say, it's not to make an excuse, but I definitely think my mental and physical state at that point yeah. definitely had something to do with – Well, so let's, let's talk about what we can learn from that. So first of all, would you, would you in that condition shoot again? I would like to say no. <laughs> How about two questions? Should you? Should you? No. I don't like, especially because, um, like I say, mentally, I, you know, I, I'd been doing pretty good. You know, I mean, the reason I'd already not stopped is the day before and earlier that day. Um, I mean, I was, I was struggling. I was having a hard time, but I hadn't, I wasn't doing anything unsafe and I felt in control. Mm -hmm. Um, but even going into that stage, I was, I think I was kind of worsening. Say I was, I was having a hard time breathing. I was coughing up blood. Um, I was getting some vertigo. Oh, really? Yeah. So even before that, you know, I, I, I straight up, I told my guys, I keep an eye on me because if this starts to get out of hand, like just flout, just stop me. Um, so should I have been probably not? And that goes back to like, we've had some conversations lately too, about, you know, the mental, you know, mental, uh, capacity of a shooter Mm -hmm. in different situations, Mm -hmm. you know, whether they should shoot or not. And it's one of those things, should I have shot? Probably not, honestly. Mm -hmm. So that's why, like, even when I DQ'd, I was like, yep, that's par for the course. I, I completely earned that. Um, definitely don't feel good about it though. Yeah, and it's. I take that personal. I did something unsafe, but through that, so the the rest of the the match, I went up to Brian. I said, "Hey, man, like I'm I'm sorry. Uh, how can I help? Like, what can I do around here?" So I ended up sticking around the next couple of days and helped him with some RO management stuff and cool. directing shooters and things like that. So that's good. That's at least the useful use of your time. Yeah, you spread, know, the, uh, spread the pneumonia. Right. <laughs> I, I, I was, I, I stepped up my, uh, my medication from that point. So <laughs> nice. But, uh, yeah, I think there's definitely some stuff, you know, to be learned about that too. It's, yeah, for sure. No, knowing your, uh, it's, it's difficult to, to know yourself and to, uh, and to sideline yourself. You know, it's one, it's, it's difficult to identify that you are impaired in some way whether by, by sleep, um, by medication, by sickness, whatever, or, you know, mental state, whatever it is. Um, and then once you've identified that, allowing yourself to take that, that time and that, that breather. Yeah. Um, yeah, like I said, it's, if it had been, you know, anything other than like, you know, a major match that I committed to before and had everything set up, mm-hmm. I would not have participated. Right. But, um, also like I say, I, I am not a person that quits. Right. <laughs> like coughing up blood. I'm like, don't worry about that. It's just a little <laughs> yeah. bit of blood. It's all good. I had some Kool-Aid before. <laughs> it's all good. It's yeah. All good. It's, it's all good. Don't syrup. Yeah. I was like, I can't breathe, but I, I'm like, I'm still functioning. Just let me, leave me be, <laughs> you know? And up until that point I was doing pretty good, but yeah, that, uh, that definitely was skirting the lines, I think. All right. So I'm going to keep an eye on you in the future. <laughs> well, you can definitely tell I still, yeah, my voice is uh, still not correct. 
even from that. It takes. You're, you're not su- talking funny. Surprisingly, it, I think I am a little bit. I can hear it, but no. I mean, you're you're making intelligent sense. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I mean, normal for you, right? <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. Yeah. You've even still uh, for some reason it takes a little bit to recover from pneumonia. I'm not sure why. <laughs> <laughs> I've never had it. I hope to never have it. So yeah, that's I, my. I want to know. That's my first encounter with it. Yeah. And again, that was uh, a little life lesson to be learned that it looks like it probably started as like a cold or like a bronchitis thing. But because I went out and physically pushed myself and mm-hmm. sucked in a bunch of dust and everything else, it, it progressed. Yeah. Well, especially out, out of hard as hell with the, the moon dust. Yes. Oh man. There I- was uh, one stage I thought I was going to pass out because I, like I got in this barrel dragging this sled thing. And when I pulled the sled, it like, puffed up a bunch. I mean, it's like flour. You right, know, like yeah. I sucked a bunch of it in. I was like, <clears throat> mm-hmm. I thought I was going to pass out. Dude, after Red October, um, I had just like goobers coming out of my nose like <laughs> all the time. And I got this uh, this bad habit. I'm, I'm the best little brother on earth. I uh, will take pictures of the nastiness that comes out and send them to my brother. <laughs> so yeah, for, for weeks it was like, you know, masonry. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Every loogie you hock up, every... Uh, we should probably get Brian checked now that I think about it. Dude, if they need he to build anything there. concrete out at that facility, like they don't have to bring in the mixture. Just bring water. Just bring water. Yeah. yeah. And I, I don't know what else you need to make it super hard, but yeah, you have everything you need right there. It's pretty crazy. Yeah. That place is, uh, it's it's a different facility for sure. Yeah. It, way different than what we're used to here in, in uh, Colorado. Yeah. I'll tell you one of the uh, interesting thing was... Is that, you know, I've always showed, shot pretty much all West Coast stuff. Mm-hmm. Up until this year, the most East Coast thing I shot was the Hornady Pandemic in Nebraska, mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. that's a, I wish they did more there. That is an amazing facility. Is it? It really is. That facility is awesome, but they do Heart, very- Heartland? Is yep. that what it's called? Heartland Shooting Park. Yeah. Yep. Um, And that place is all grass. Nice. Oh, like, cool. Like, it's nice. And you know us, like if it's not dust and rocks and around here and all that, yeah. like we don't know what to do. But <laughs> this year going to shoot Fort Benning, you know, it's like, to me, that place is like a golf course. Yeah. Like I showed up, like all the bays literally have like concrete drainage systems underneath them and like the- Wow. Yeah. It's it's a very nice facility. I'm like, there's there's no dust. Um, What do I do with this? <laughs> <laughs> I, I was highly confused. <laughs> yeah. And, there, and I was like, there's green. What is this green stuff in my scope? Exactly. Yeah. And that, that's, uh, that's one thing I've noticed when, you know, you, you travel all over, like they cater the type of matches, obviously to the terrain. And when I was in, uh, Forest Lake, Minnesota, shooting the, uh, Nordic Vortex Trigun, I got my butt handed to me on the jungle run because, you know, first of all, I was shooting the RO match. So, like the weed whackers hadn't come through, you know, and by that I mean the other two hundred competitors that cleared out the whole thing. But um, man, you had to like pop your head around, and you're like, I think there was five over there, but that maybe there's five over there, fifteen paces from here. I mean, it gets gets uh gets confusing, and when we're not used to that kind of stuff, you know, we don't have the repetitions that local shooters in that area do. Yeah, that's uh, that's definitely one thing I want to try to experience. Uh I don't know if it'll be this upcoming season or not. I want to get out east and do some more. I really want to go shoot Gen 3 in Missouri, three-gun championship. I was championship. just going to say Gen 3. Um, Chad Francis, man. I met him at Pandemic, my first major, and mm-hmm. we were squatted with him and Katie. Those are great people. Yes. And that match looks phenomenal. I it's really great. want to shoot it. Um, I want to get out and shoot a little bit more of that East Coast stuff just to get a little you know, change in flavor. Yeah, There's sure. so much more open terrain and jungle runs and greenery and mm-hmm. – Things like that. Yeah, it, it's it's interesting for sure. It's its own animal. It really is. Yeah. I say just different flavor. And mm-hmm. that's one of the great things about three gun is there's so many different flavors of three gun. That's one of the cool things about the uh, the Surefire World yeah. multi gun is like you get to shoot them all. Yeah. You pretty much I mean the terrain's the same, but the style of shooting is varied every three stages. Mm-hmm. You know, which is that's definitely cool. I really like that match. It's a good one. That's on my list. Yeah, that's a really good match. Well, for, I'm really looking forward to the uh, expedition this year. Yeah, expedition multi gun. Yeah, that looks awesome. Yeah, there's a a shot show expedition match. That's a you know club match after shot show, probably like four or five stages something like that. Then I'm gonna go shoot. Yeah. That should be a good one. That's all UML format, right? Yep. 
Yeah. Yep, put on by Pete Ramsey. The, the UML, I really hope that takes off because... I'm looking forward to trying it out. Yeah, like we talked about earlier, the I think the most fun match I shot this year was Kerry Palmer Cedar Valley multi-gun match. Yeah. It was, it was just so much fun to shoot. I really like that format. Yeah, I'm looking forward to uh, to test. I'm not looking forward to reading another rule book. Like I figured, I already had all the rules down. But uh, the I rules think that's, are it's a pretty, small hump. Yeah, rules are pretty straightforward. Only thing you have to look at is uh, penalties for target distance. Because oh, the, and that applies in some weird ways. Because for especially for the UML format, even though a lot, there's a lot of confusion with that too, because a lot of people think UML is only one format. There's actually, I think, three different types of UML. Mm-hmm. So there's like traditional three gun with long range stuff. Oh, okay. And then there's like the uh, expedition type where you can shoot at PCC and all that. And the long range is all scaled. So that's interesting. You say that. Cause I had heard from, um, a mutual friend of ours that one of his concerns was there was only two guns involved in every stage, no three gun stages. Correct. Is, is that correct? That is for, said- yep. That is for the expedition style. Oh, okay. But every, there, there, every, it, yeah, yeah, every stage is two gun only. But there is a format of UML that does use all three gun. Yes. Problem solved. Yeah, yeah. UML is very versatile. Cool. And that's kind of the thing with that is they're trying to cater to make it so where everybody can shoot. Um, and even like the two gun format runs just so smooth and fast. Mm-hmm. And the scaled long range, a lot of people discredit that. I can tell you that that scaled long range <laughs> is not easy. Yeah. Like at the uh, the Cedar Valley match, we shot golf balls at 20, I think it was 25 yards inside a barrel. Mm-hmm. And they were held up. It was cool the way they did. They took a no shoot and like turned into a little pyramid with a cutout and just stuck a golf ball in it hmm. inside a barrel. So okay. you couldn't see where you were hitting when you were missing everything like that. But a golf ball, you had to shoot the golf ball out of the little holder. Interesting. So a golf ball at 25 yards during a stage is a difficult yeah. target. Well, we've shot some golf balls at local matches. It's not my favorite target. Yeah, it, and not just because it's difficult. It just feels dumb. It's like, for, for me, because like this is, it feels like plinking. Like I could go put this out at my, you know, out in the national forest next to some eggs and some pop cans and shoot this. Yeah, but I mean, you're still... I think that's still just, a challenge. But. Well, yeah, I think that's just a, a, a mental perspective, though, because if Absolutely. you ta- if you take, you know, an eight inch plate at two hundred or a golf ball at twenty five, right. the target difficulty is pretty well, close. But here's here's the thing: like, I know it's a mental block. If that were a piece of steel at that same distance at twenty five yards and the same diameter as a golf ball, I would not think twice about it. I'd be like, oh, that's gonna be hard, and that, that's it. So, yeah, you're absolutely right. It is a mental thing. Yeah. It, and even when we went up, I was like, oh, that doesn't look too bad. Man, I saw so many people get owned by that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it, it was funny. <laughs> but that was – I really liked the the format. And even said the scaled long range, I, I'm talking to a lot of people that haven't done it. They discredit it. Mm-hmm. It is a lot more difficult than what a lot of people realize. So Right. Well, one of my, um, my last questions here is uh, where do you see the sport of three-gun headed? And – Based on what you just said and some conversations we had before we started rolling here, seems like you're a pretty big fan of UML. I am. I really like the the versatility of it because, like we've talked about before, there there's a lot of people that aren't getting in a three gun because they don't, you know, like one gun. Most mm-hmm. a lot of people for some reason don't like to shoot the shotgun, mm-hmm. and or say they don't have three guns, but they want to do the type of shooting that we're doing. The th- the nice part of UML, one, it runs very fast. So like what we talked about before where a match takes all day, mm-hmm. that does not apply with UML. Um, the other part of that is that they have a division for everybody. You can shoot it traditional three-gun. You can shoot it two-gun. You can shoot it four-gun. You can shoot it two-by-four. You can shoot it PCC. Mm-hmm. Um, you can shoot in any basically you know type you want. <laughs> Right. So it, it gets more people involved and it's being that it runs faster and a little smoother. I think it opens it up for more people to shoot also. So the th- I think yeah. the thing that I really like about it is that I think it's just going to help grow the sport to bring more people in because even from a new shooter perspective, um, if you go out and just shoot it two gun, like all two gun or you shoot it all PCC, you have less gear. It's less things to think about on the clock. Yeah. You know, cause shooting, 
like three gun stage is true. Like all three guns on one stage for a new shooter. That's a lot of things to think about, have a lot of gear on. Um, and then even younger shooters. So say you have a younger shooter that would struggle holding up a, an AR or a 12 gauge shotgun, 20 gauge shotgun yeah, sh- with th- a 12 round magazine. Yeah. I mean, they can shoot PCC. You can build a light little PCC and they can shoot next to mom and dad mm-hmm. shooting true three gun at UML. Yeah. So I yeah, think it just opens things up and I think it's going to help drive the sport a little bit. So hopefully it'll go that way. Awesome. Well, it'll be, it'll be interesting to see and, uh, need to get Pete on to chat about it. And, uh, and get his uh, his perspective on like the the big picture because it sounds like there's some pretty interesting things in the mix. Yeah, there's a lot of things even beyond that that they have going. There's uh there's talk of a UML pistol only league, kind of yeah. like USPSA, mm-hmm. um, and a few other things there. And the great thing is like Pete's dedicated a lot to it. So if you you know you decide to start up a UML um, club match or you know facility or whatever he comes out and helps set it up and get everything rolling sweet so it's so far it's looking like a uh it's looking like a good possibility nice all right for final question here if you can leave the audience with just one thought or one piece of advice what would it be oh man first have fun three gun is about having fun yes and uh i think focus is the key thing to your performance I think, you know, that focusing on the task at hand, whether it's, you know, the live fire or if you're dry firing at home or just what you're doing in that moment, focus on that, not what's ahead of you or behind you. I like it. Well, Forrest, man, this has been a, a ton of fun. I really do uh, appreciate you coming down here from Loveland, first of all, to uh, to be with me in the studio and uh, for sharing your your knowledge and your journey with, uh, with the audience of the Three Gun Show. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, man. It's a, that's how we can share a beer that way. It's a lot better than over Skype. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Morris. Thank you. And before you take off, make sure you check out the show notes at threegunshow.com for links to things that we discussed in the podcast. You can also sign up on Patreon as a Three Gun Show supporter or purchase your very own Born to Three Gun t-shirt. As always, this podcast is brought to you by Armalite, and Armalite has allowed me to get special pricing for listeners on their line of three-gun rifles, both the 13.5 and the 18-inch, as well as their competition handguards, gas blocks, and tunable muzzle brakes. If you're in the market for a rifle or components to build your own, you can email me, dave at threegunshow.com, and uh, I'll hook you up. Thank you so much for downloading, listening, and subscribing to the show. I'm Dave Hartman, Forrest Lathrop, and we'll see you on the range. Unload show clear.